Children's Sunday School at 9.30. Now, the basic crew is here again this week. Harry Fulkerson's running the camera and he's doing the internet posting that uh, um, he'll, he'll be able to play. He's done that for us every week and uh, he's more than six feet away from us and so everybody's in good shape here. You just heard from Mark and Taylor Sullivan. Mark Smith is way back in the back and he's running the sound for us this morning. And my name is Jack Greeno. I'm the pastor here at Grace Community Baptist Church in the Colony, Texas. And we thank you for joining the five of us. God willing, we will be back normal next week. Amen. But I want to uh, emphasize that if you fall into the category of high risk, that you stay at home. As much as we would love to see everybody here, if you are in what that high risk category that the doctors have made very well known to us, then please stay at home because we would we would uh, want to see you for the long haul and not just for a short period of time. So uh, anyway, we're going to run this kind of like we have the last few weeks. Harry will get this up so that it will come on right about the time that we would normally have church service and then we'll go back to normal schedules where we where we take the service live and then Harry gets it up in the early afternoon as soon as possible. So anyway, we're excited about all that. Uh, I've discovered that um, uh, I have enough razor blades to last until 2025 <laughs> at, this, at the rate of only having to shave once a week, which is kind of strange. Well, last week we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we, cons we saw the, the 10 different characteristics of true believers. And we saw how the Thessalonians had developed a reputation that spread throughout their region in a day that was difficult to do that. And we can see how it becomes important that in order for the gospel to spread in a way that honors our Lord, we simply must live in a way that supports his teachings and we must then share the gospel with people around us both by the spoken word or testimony and by our behavior. It's a dangerous thing to operate the Christian life 
trying to discern other people's motives. Last week we looked at how Paul used the Thessalonians as an example for other churches to follow and decided their report card was very good. In this morning's passage, we'll look at the importance of a pure heart in any area of Christian service. Now, some people will point this particular passage directly at spiritual leadership, and I'm not disputing that, I'm simply expanding it. It simply doesn't matter which role you may have in any church body. These principles all come into play. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that a pure heart is of utmost importance, whatever your mission in the kingdom of God is. Now, there are clearly exceptions in ministry, as there always have been. But by and large, people don't enter ministry for fame and money. I used to tell seminary students that if you're getting into this to, for the money, then you might as well go do something else. This is not, people don't get in this to make money. Now, as I said a second ago, there clearly are exceptions. There are people who make huge amounts of money in this. But what we'll see here with Paul is that that was absolutely not the goal, and it flies in the face of the nature and the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was not involved with the Thessalonians to make a name for himself. He was concerned with their spiritual development, especially since they came to faith as a result of his preaching. And as a pastor, I understand the unique responsibility of proclaiming the good news of the saving gospel of Jesus. Pastors, as we saw as we studied the pastoral epistles, must also be able to correct doctrinal errors, whether they are presented within the body or from the outside. And as we'll see shortly, Paul completely defended the motives of those on the missionary journeys, realizing that the new birth and spiritual growth of converts are at the heart and the purpose of ministry. As we've seen, he dealt with false teachers to the level that we see them today. He just didn't have the 24-7 presence of cable TV or the internet for his opponents to be able to use as we have today. Now, as I mentioned last week, as great as this church was, they were not above error and the inability to recognize it. Paul and his team were being attacked as frauds by those who actually were frauds. Therefore, it was necessary to defend his honor as well as the men with him while he was patting this church on the back. Now let's read these six verses together this morning. So even if you're watching at home, please stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. Would you pray with me, please? Father, in, in the time that we have here, I just ask that as we open this, this passage of your scripture, we ask that, that the power of your spirit be upon us. We pray, Father, that you will illuminate it to us we pray that you will give us the wisdom and the ability to apply it to our lives so that we can be more like you with each passing day. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Please be seated. So let's look in verse 1 and we'll see a hopeful destination. Hopeful destination. Verse 1 says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Now, as I've said the past two weeks, Acts chapter 17, you can kind of go back to 16, 17, and 18 and see some of the details of this. And it records the first visit to Thessalonica. It started off well, but Paul and Silas have to pack up and leave at night for Berea and, and escape a mob of, Jew, mob of Jews who were ready to start a riot. The Jews proceed to use the swift departure to slander the missionaries and create doubt among the new believers who were there. Now I want you to see in his language an appeal to their common bond in order to win back their favor. He appeals to their brotherhood and reminds them that they are already aware of the great success of the previous visit. If he spent the first chapter bragging on them, he's going to move here into a line of defense regarding the effectiveness. Clearly these people were living for the Lord in such a wonderful way that Paul's trip could not have been regarded as anything except successful. You can see the words in vain from a couple of different perspectives, either empty as in having no yield, but that was clearly not the case, but it can also be seen as lacking purpose, as if it were an accident. Even if that were the case, and he assures them that it was not, the results could not support that argument. From this point, we'll see the other aspects that are used to defend his ministry in Thessalonica. The opposition he faced, the exhortation he offered, his true motivation, and the humiliation that was required for God to receive the glory rather than Paul. Look in verse 2, he finishes his sentence. What we see here is the horrible opposition. Verse 2 says, But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. Now again, you're, you'll get a much better feel for this if you invest the time, and most of us have some time these days, and go back and read Acts 16. This particular, what he's referring to here, is Acts 16, 16 through 24. Now for the sake of time, just let me summarize it quickly then, rather than reading another long passage of, of Scripture. While they were going to a prayer meeting, they ran into a slave girl who had a demon, but was able to tell fortunes and make money for her owners. She openly called Paul and his team men who were proclaiming the plan of salvation, as if that were some kind of insult, right? Paul exercised the, the demon, but that ruined the profit of the owners, so they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace in front of the authorities. They were accused of creating confusion because the gospel was not compatible with Judaism. Paul and Silas had their robes torn off and they were beaten with rods and they were thrown in jail and put in stocks. They suffered. We saw in verse 2, they, they had suffered and they were mistreated. Now the word there for suffered refers to physical abuse. Well, you might think that mistreated is just another word for it. Mistreated deals with, with more of an emotional humiliation which sometimes carried legal abuse with it as well. I mean, normally when we think of abuse, we think of physical and, and verbal abuse, but there's also legal abuse when someone's attorney beats up yours. The Greek word for mistreated is hubrizo, which is obviously where the English word hubris originates. And as many of you know, hubris refers to an extreme sense of pride. Um, I'll leave it at that. Hubrizo involves a deep measure of humiliation, usually public. You put these two ideas together, what you get is a sense of how they were treated in Philippi by the non-believers there. They suffered physically. They suffered emotionally. Now that we have that idea in mind, we read how Paul makes sure the Thessalonians understood that this extremely harsh treatment 
for the sake of the gospel did not deter them from their mission. In fact, right after being abused, they preached in Thessalonica where they were accused of treason and then attacked by a mob. And again, if you want to take the time to do this, go back and this is all in Acts 17. It's probably better for our understanding to see the words but after right there in the first part of verse 2 as although. The point is that they continued to preach in spite of the abuse that they were dealt. We can also conclude in this that the abusive reception was for the missionaries a clear indicator that they were on the right track. Popular preaching doesn't yield that type of response. When sin is called out, people stiffen their backs and they resist the message. And yet we can't miss Paul's point here that their unusual boldness came directly from God because this is simply not how human flesh responds to drastic opposition. This is the power of the Holy Spirit that continued to preach through them. Here, here's another reference point, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Paul writes, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The power that gave those disciples boldness is available to us today. We need to pray for it. We need to look for opportunities to share the gospel within the family or the marketplace. And we need to understand that people are rejecting Jesus rather than us. If this is new for you, then you're not going to be like Paul and Silas early on. But we need to get to a point where we're doing this frequently, frequently enough and regularly enough to where this becomes second nature to us rather than something that I think I'll give it a try. We also need to imitate Paul by continuing on even when successes don't come. And we have some dear friends who come to a Bible study in our home and Gail was used mightily to point them to Christ. These people have a burden for many, many of their family members who are lost. This couple continues to share the gospel with family members who continue to graciously reject it. Some obviously are more gracious than others. Yet this couple regularly sends emails to family members that are just dripping with love, pleading with relatives and in-laws to trust in Jesus alone for salvation. They continue to receive rejection, but they continue to lovingly urge their family to die to themselves, to pick up their cross, and to follow Jesus. Now back to the text of the term, gospel of God will appear twice more in this passage, and Paul uses it three other places. It refers to the fact that God is the author of salvation while Jesus is the agent. This Greek word here for opposition is agon, which is where we get the English word agony. And we, we've seen this before just a few weeks back. It literally refers to a fight or a struggle. This opposition wasn't a simple disagreement. This is not a situation just where opinions are not shared. It's a fight. And in spite of the fight, they shared the good news of God's plan of salvation, which had now gone from the Jew first to also include the Gentiles. Folks, we haven't really seen the, the real fight yet in America. But it feels more like a fight every day. You don't have to look around very far to hear or read or see instances where the government and or certain people are making it difficult to worship and for people to do certain things. It's becoming a fight. We're not in a fight like Paul and Silas were in a fight, but uh, 
when it gets to that point, then we'll have to learn how to rely on the Holy Spirit to give us boldness to speak the gospel. Let's look at verse 3. We'll see an honorable exhortation. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. Here, Paul continues his defense by answering some of the accusations he's heard before and that will continue to worsen as his ministry lengthens. He's clear here that there may be many messages floating around from many missionaries who claim to be speaking for God, but he states that his message to the Thessalonians is based on the truth. Unlike false teachers whose platforms are based on deceit, Paul is clear that his is not. Now, I've quoted statistics before as to how lowly regarded pastors are in America today, based primarily on the fact that they are, in many cases, swindlers and adulterers who pose as men of God. The word for exhortation is often used nicer in English than the word actually conveys in Greek. It's from the same root as the, as the word for the Holy Spirit that deals with someone who comes alongside. Human exhortations are then generally from someone who has the best interests of someone else at heart, but is usually more of an urgent call, perhaps to repentance or to at least some type of adjustment. It also carries with it a tone of judgment, and there's just no way to get around that. Thus Paul preached with this type of urgent appeal to a type of change of behavior. You can see how this type of message is not as much fun and therefore not as popular in today's churches. Yet, make no mistake, there was no error in this judgmental type of preaching which he delivered to them. If you're a Jew, you naturally attack the Christian message as being filled with error. Now, going through the pastoral epistles, we saw numerous verses about the importance of sound doctrine. So I won't call for, uh, I won't bring any of them up for support here. We just went through that relatively short time ago. The word impurity here doesn't necessarily refer to the soundness of doctrine, which would fit here. This Greek word can be used to describe physical or social cleanness yet almost always is used to describe a sexual perversion. It's basically where we get the word catharsis with a negating prefix on it. So why would Paul introduce improper sex into this discussion? Now, many of the Greek and pagan religions used sex in their religious practices. Corinth was known for temple prostitution. The basic idea was that the way to get close to a God, little g, was to be intimate with someone who had been intimate with his spokesman. Now some of you remember the Moonies from the late 60s and 70s. In order for members of this cult to be legally married, they had to have intimacy with Reverend Moon, but as he got older and as the cult grew larger, that was amended to allow some sort of chain effect or some kind of domino effect. You, it was kind of like you knew someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew Reverend Moon. Then it was okay to get married, and then it would be okay for you to have peace with whatever you consider God to be. False teachers would enter areas in the first century, just like Paul, Timothy, and Silas entered into Thessalonica. They would, these false teachers would enter into these areas, and they would make that claim. And if women would have sex with these men, it would be an enriched spiritual experience. What a hook. Paul clearly wants no association with them. He doesn't want anybody to confuse him with them or them with him. Now, speaking of hooks, this word deceit literally translates fish hook or trick or trap. But just like the false teachers of today that try to lure our money away from us, they were known for that centuries ago. 
Paul is making sure that the Thessalonians viewed him as getting nothing from them. He wanted no money. He wanted no sex. He wanted no error-filled messages that made Christianity too good to be true. There's nothing in it for Paul except the glory of God. Look in verse 4. We'll see heavenly motivation. Finishing the sentence, it says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Now this is the ultimate trump card, isn't it? Paul wasn't inventing some religion to try to meet his fleshly needs. He was delivering the truth of God's plan of salvation, and to do so required being approved of God. The Greek word here is quite long, but it's quite precise. It involves three or four different actions to tell you about, to, but some of you may not be able to remember eighth grade grammar, so I'm not going to go over it. It refers to someone who has been tested and found worthy. Now, unlike these other charlatans, Paul wasn't self-appointed. In fact, the opposite was true because he was persecuting Christians when he was Saul of Tarsus. Yet, again, don't see this simply as a trump card. He rejoiced in the fact that he was counted worthy to share the gospel even though he had been an enemy of it. What I want you to see here is what I consider to be the key to effective ministry. It's the key to spiritual growth and it's the key to any type of Christian ministry. Very simply, it's that our motivation for everything that we do in life should be to draw applause from heaven. If we preach in such a way as to make humans happy, then our message will invariably become self-serving. Listen, everyone loves accolades and everyone loves to actually be able to experience those accolades. Don't see this as your pastor should not care what you think. It's a different approach when you say that your pastor should care more about what God thinks than what you think. And since the Bible is how we know what God thinks, preaching purely from the Bible is the best way for a church to experience God. Church members frequently jump to conclusions about a pastor's motives. When Paul says that God is the one who examines our hearts. Listen, nobody can hide an impure motive from God. You can fool other pastors. I used to tell seminary students, you, you can fool professors. And you can fool certain church members. But you can't fool God. There's almost nothing better that someone can say about any Christian minister or any Christian who is involved in ministry that what is said here of Paul, Silas, Silas, and Timothy, God knew that these men had no desire to simply make people feel good with their message. Their purpose was to please God by encouraging his people to continue to grow and develop in Christ-likeness. Paul's motive was not to build a reputation, to, but to present the good news of Jesus for the benefit of the listener, whoever or wherever. If our goal is to please people, then we must answer only to people. If our goal is to please God, then we answer to Him alone. It doesn't mean that Paul never altered his message to fit his audience, because we know he did. But he did so without changing the vital truth of the message. I want to ask you this morning, would you like to see some spiritual growth in your life? Operate under this directive. That you are in this, in obedience to God and solely for His glory. Everything else will fall into place. Look at verse 5. We'll see a holy collaboration. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with the pretext for greed. God is witness. And since God had approved Paul as his mouthpiece, or his spokesman, if you like that better, 
Paul calls on him here as a witness and the ultimate one. That Paul's message was not seasoned with flattery. And when I think of flattery, my mind jumps to the old, old TV show, Leave it to Beaver, where one of their neighborhood friends was always complimenting Mrs. Cleaver for the sake of buttering her up if he ever needed anything out of her. For a teenager, Eddie Haskell was a master manipulator of adult housewives. Like Eddie, there were some selfish motives involved, but Paul had likely been accused of trying to get something out of the Thessalonians, so Paul clearly states that he never charmed them in order to make money. There's an aspect of that at every fundraising event that you might attend. Now the word here for pretext means to cloak or to camouflage. Paul and his people never came using smooth words to create a stealth fundraising effort, which would be an excellent description of the false teachers both then and now. They're fundraisers. And the only person that benefited from the fundraising was them, were themselves. Remember that Paul was a bivocational minister, to use contemporary language. He made tents and he lived frugally so that he could make these journeys and support Christians who were being persecuted in other parts of the world. He was not there to hustle money out of them. He was there to feed them from the Word of God. Now let's look at verse 6 and we'll see the honorary humiliation. Verse 6, finishing his sentence, he says, Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. Now there's one final way to garner the applause of humans, and that is to tout credentials. This becomes highly important for Paul, as we see in other letters, because his opponents attacked his use of the word apostle. In fact, Paul had to defend his pedigree almost everywhere to avoid being collateral damage from the not-so-friendly fire of the false teachers. Yet, the participle for seeking glory was in the present tense, meaning he wasn't constantly seeking praise. His unique status of a persecutor converted into a missionary always stayed in the front of his mind that he didn't deserve human applause. If his work had accomplished anything that would benefit the kingdom of God, then God alone was due the glory. They would have known that that claim wouldn't stick on him in their camp. But he adds that it simply cannot be found. Therefore, they only spoke the truth in Thessalonica. There was no flattery to separate them from their money. There was no softening of the gospel to make it more easily acceptable like the prosperity gospel that we have today. There were no motives that were hidden to elevate themselves. Not only did they not try to gain financial and emotional support from the Thessalonians, they made sure that they were of no financial burden to these folks whatsoever. Nothing mattered to these men except living lives that line up with the teachings of Christ and proclaiming the good news that trusting Jesus is the only way for sinful humanity to be made right with holy God. His plan of salvation was in place, and Paul was the predominant voice of the faith. But Paul only wanted to hear the Lord one day say, Well done, good and faithful servant. He could not care less how well he was received, or even if he faced abuse. He wanted the applause of heaven more than he wanted the applause of heaven. Of mankind. Now, when we finish chapter 2, we will have seen another list of 10 characteristics of a godly minister to go along with the 10 characteristics of true believers that we saw the two previous weeks. 
Thus far, we've seen how godly ministers speak the truth with pure motives. They seek to please God rather than people. They do not use flattery to obtain wealth. And they do not seek the praise of other people. We'll finish the list next week. God willing, would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you for this urgent and vital and timeless message from the Apostle Paul. That our mission in everything that we do would be to seek the applause of heaven. To be found obedient to you rather than to be popular here on earth. So I pray, Father, that you will remind us every step that we take of our mission to hear you say, well, well done, good and faithful servant. May you be blessed through our time in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So for our YouTube visitors this morning, I, I ask if you've never turned away from your sin and turn toward the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I ask you to email me. It's jackreno at gmail.com. That's G-R-E-E-N-O-E. -E -E. I'd love the chance to visit with you and help you understand the importance of this decision. Have a great day in the Lord. Stay, stay safe. God willing, we'll see a, a full house here next week.